this edition of Out of the Park. I'm your host, Bob Souza, speaking from the heart of Somerset Village, Main Street, Cable Access, TV 9, in historic Somerset, Massachusetts. My guest today, Bill O'Neill, clerk at the advisory board of SATV 9. Bill is a long standing Boston Red Sox fan who at times has had his heart broken, at other times has felt the joy and elation of what it means to be a Royal Red Sox fan. So we welcome Bill to SATV 9 Studios and hope that you enjoy today's program, which will be a trip down memory lane. Bill, welcome. Well, glad to have you with thank us. Thank you, Bob. I feel very comfortable here sitting with the uh, probably the top sports historian in Somerset. So anything I don't know about the Red Sox, I'm sure Bob does. And just a comment on heartbreaking and joy. There's been many more heartbreaks in my uh, lifetime in rooting for the Red Sox than there have been joys. But it's been interesting over over that whole period of time. And I'll turn it back to Bob now and let him go through uh, a little bit on what baseball looked like in the past. Well, Bill, one of the things that we have to point out is the dead ball era occurred between the wars, between World War I, World War II, and it actually came to an end because of two incidents in the year 1920. The first one was a 26-inning game played May 1st, 1920 at historic Braves Field. The 26-inning game was between the Brooklyn Dodgers and the home team Boston Braves. The starting pitchers went the entire 26 innings. Leon Cador for the Brooklyn Dodgers pitched against Joe Hossinger for the Boston Braves. Three hours, 50 minutes elapsed time for 26 innings, roughly that of a, an hour and 15 minutes a game. And one of the reasons they were able to pitch the full game and we had the dead ball era was because all they used would be three baseballs. We have the original three balls from the game for 26 innings. And you can see they're dark in color. Some have lost their shape. Some are rather scuffed up. But it was an enormous advantage to the pitcher in that era because he could control where the ball was going and even if he put it over the middle of the plate and a vicious swing and a tumultuous sound occurred, the ball really went nowhere because it was used for the entire game. So that was the situation, three baseballs used in 1920, May 1st, 26 innings. Same pitchers pitched the full game. The next incident occurred August 16th, 1920, and we can see the ball that was used in the tragic death of Ray Chapman. Ray Chapman was the shortstop for the Cleveland Indians, and he was playing for Cleveland, battling the New York Yankees in the Polo Grounds, which was the Yankees' home park 10 years prior to Yankee Stadium opening. And 1923. In the seventh inning, this was the size, shape, and color of the baseball used, to, which was delivered from submarine pitcher Carl Mays and hit Ray Chapman just above the left ear and temple, crushing his skull, causing internal bleeding, which could not be prevented. Within 24 hours, Ray Chaplin succumbed. He's been the only player ever killed in a Major League Baseball game. So with that, the Major Leagues changed to a situation where new baseballs had to be used. 
the umpire was in possession of three brand new white balls and he also had another nine in reserve. So they started each game with 12 new baseballs which would be used at their brightest so that injury might be prevented. Today's world, they use 72 baseballs, six dozen, the start of every game. Bill, one of the pitches that was legalized throughout baseball and proved to be one of the most difficult to hit was a legal pitch called the knuckleball. This was the toughest ball to control, the toughest ball to hit, and the toughest ball to catch. Hall of Fame receiver Rick Farrell started his career with the St. Louis Browns, was traded to the Boston Red Sox, finished his 18-year career during World War II with the Washington Senators. He had to catch four knuckleball pitchers who pitched, who started and completed 85 to 90 percent of the games. Johnny Nigling, Dutch Leonard, uh, let me see, Roger Wolf were right-handers and a left-hander, Mickey Hefner. So those four pitchers started 90 percent of the Washington Senator games and they were caught in 144 games by Rick Farrell, who that year amassed only 21 pass balls. Today, a major league catcher trying to catch the knuckleball averages three or four pass balls a game. So we can see what a great receiver and a Hall of Fame catcher Rick Farrell became. Bill, for your thoughts on some of the great Red Sox players in the 1920s, 30s and 40s, and some of the incidents attributed to the Red Sox, I will try to jog your memory. I may need, you may need to, you may need to, because there weren't that many great Red Sox players during that period. That was a very downtime, really, for the uh, Red Sox uh, franchise. But I had a question for you, Is, was that 26 in a game, the longest uh, major league game, or has that the, been exceeded. The longest uh, game in Major League history, yes. Minor League, it's 33 innings, which took a day and a half and probably into another week when the Rochester Red Wings were going to come back to Pawtucket to finish the game, which officially lasted 33 innings. Yeah, that started on an Easter Saturday, I think. That is correct. Into Easter morning, yeah. Yeah, they could not get in uh -huh. touch with the president of the league and they didn't know officially what the curfew would be, but that's the longest game in history, 33 innings. The major league record is this 26 inning game, which was played three hours and 50 minutes. There are some major league games today which go four hours and are only nine inning games. Amazing. Looking at what the uh Rundown you've given the audience on the uh, e evolving the situation as far as the baseballs that are used. Uh, you could see though why a, a game in, in those days might have the potential of being longer than a game today. Only because as the game went along, the ball got deader and deader. Uh, it got scuffed up, so you got a little more action on the ball as you the batter was looking at it come at him, and it was less likely that you had one swing and a home run that might break open the game. So I can see why that landed. But getting back to the uh, the Red Sox in that period uh, post World War One, Bob I think has mentioned the the success in earlier programs that the Red Sox had during the World War One era, where they participated in a lot of the uh, really well series, had a good record. Uh, everything was going in their favor until uh, I think it was a guy named Frazier that decided to uh, trade uh, Babe Ruth uh, to the Yankees. Very good point, Bill. <laughs> Harry Frazee was a Broadway yeah. 
musical producer. His play, No, No, Nanette, was running out of funds on Broadway. So he thought, if I could sell one of my more profitable ball players, I could get money to keep the play going and still perhaps keep the franchise going. So he sold Babe Ruth to the Yankees for about $135,000 and other uh, ancillary bids on later players. But what happened, amazing story there, Bill, the Yankee right fielder at the time in 1919 was George Hallis from the University of Illinois, was a star football baseball player as a collegian. And when Babe Ruth went from the Red Sox to the Yankees, Hallis figured, this is it for me. I will not, no longer have a professional baseball career ahead of me. So he went into his second love. And that became the Chicago Bears. The Chicago right. Bears. Yeah. He became owner, coach, uh, general manager, ticket seller, everything for the Chicago Bears. They were known as the Decatur Staley's first, then the Chicago Bears. And that's when the National Football League was formed around the... Uh, the 1920-21 season. Like I was saying, after the, the Red Sox lost Babe, then they went in kind of a depressing period of time where uh, they really weren't uh, competitive or creating any excitement. Uh, uh, the, the attendance uh, at the park at that time would uh, typically be under uh, under 10,000, maybe four, five, six thousand on a particularly on a weekday, no night games or anything. So it was it was it was a different uh, era in baseball. And then in the mid uh, uh, early 30s, uh, the Red Sox were sold to a guy named Tom Yorkey. And Yorkey was the uh, foster child of an uncle who was the uh, owner of the uh, Detroit Tigers. Uh, and he was also a very wealthy individual, and he made Tom Yorkie wealthy. And I guess Tom got the idea, let's use my money that I have, and I'll, I'll create a team. And I'll get into the play World Series, not the playoffs, because we didn't have playoffs at that time. And it, uh, it looked like he was making some progress as you go, went towards uh, the late 30s and towards World War II. But uh, he was a very adamant person, kind of controlled what was being done with the team, as I read about it. Uh, there were so many decisions that the baseball people wanted to make weren't the same as Tom Yorkey wanted to make but Yorkie won out. Uh, but it was an interesting period of time, and he was picking up players like uh, Jimmy Fox, that was a great hitter, uh, Lefty Grove, one of the great pitchers. Uh, he, Bob talked about the Ferrells. Uh, he picked up the Ferrells from Washington. Uh, he was trying to buy a team, but never seemed to be able to, to get the pitching that they needed to, to compete. So, although they had these sluggers, and Joe Cronin was another guy, he, uh, he got from Washington, I believe, who became the manager and then eventually the general, general manager of the Red Sox. Uh, but it was kind of a down period. No great excitement, no great attendance, no great publicity, until you started reaching towards World War II and then the Red Sox started to uh, pick up some players like uh, Ted Williams, Johnny Pesky, I think he was before World War II, right? Bobby Doyle, Bobby Doyle was uh, the first one, yep, yeah. 1937. Rudy York. Rudy York, they purchased from yeah. the Tigers from the World Series uh, 45 right. of champs. He also played in 46. World Series for Boston. Dom DiMaggio. Dom DiMaggio yeah. up in 41. Yeah. Now, the only problem was all these guys were, were good ball players and tremendous hitters, but you don't see many pitchers that he's picking up. And 
You don't win baseball games without having a good pitching staff. It's so dependent upon having a good uh, pitching staff. So they went into uh, the World War II period uh, with, with a, a potential, but that fell apart, of course, when uh, a lot of the players were picked up and uh, called into the service. And I, I got a personal story about that because if that didn't happen, they wouldn't have brought some of these other players up to the major leagues. And one of the players the Red Sox brought up in 42, 43, he probably would not have been brought up if they still had the major leaguers over there, was a pitcher named Emmett O'Neill. Now, at the time I was a young boy in grammar school at St. Louis School, which is right next to South Park, which is now Kennedy, and after school, we'd run over the park and play ball. And the kids started calling me Emmett. You know, and like a kid, a nickname sticks with you. And I've held that name. Uh, well, a lot of people still call me Emmett. But for a lifetime, other than my family calling me Bill or Billy, everyone called me Emmett. So if they, if they didn't take those players away, I probably never would have had that nickname. And it wasn't because he was a great player, but he was a run-of-the-mill uh, uh, in the starting rotation. So so with that, that brings us up to, uh, but there's a, a lot of things that now are happening at the, in, during the World War II period. Well, they were very strong uh, prior to the war. 41 and 42, they finished second place, uh, let's see, both times the Yankees beat them out for the pennant, and also their other good years before the war, only two good years, 38 and 39, they finished second to the Yankees. But other than that, they were fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth place in the Yorkie era. So they had four chances in which they uh, were runner-up to the Yankees, 38, 39, 41, 42. Joe Cronin, as you mentioned, uh, was picked up by them in 35 as a player manager to be the shortstop and manager. What happened as Joe got along in years, he was weak defensively shortstop. The Red Sox under Yorkie and Eddie Collins bought the Louisville Colonels of the American Association. They bought the entire franchise in order to get shortstop Pee Wee Reese. So Pee Wee was going to be the heir apparent and shortstop for Boston. Cronin said, no, I can still make the plays. I still want to play every day. So he had Yorkie sell Pee Wee Reese to the Brooklyn Dodgers. The Dodgers managed by, at that time, player manager Leo DeRocha knew right away Reese is much better than I am. He's younger, quicker, steadier, and I'm just going to be a bench manager. No more playing. If Cronin had said the same thing, there would have been perhaps a pennant or two in Boston in those years that Pee Wee played for Brooklyn. But you weren't going to get Joe out of that position, right? No, he didn't he leave. He was calling the shots, and he was going to keep playing. He didn't leave till 47, 13 years as the player manager, and really his forte, Bill, was only as a pinch hitter at the end of his career. But he could hit, but he was a detriment in the field. So he was the general manager, and an indication of one of the points you made earlier, where, they disagree, where disagreements were made, sometimes Mr. Yorkie was overruled, even though it was his money. So you can see after their glory years in the teens, where they were uh, participants in many World Series, they went through a static, a down period, and they were starting to come out of it late into the 30s before World War II. Well, God bless uh, Mr. Yorkie in one respect. He saved the franchise. When Harry Frazee sold it, he sold it to a... Uh, outfit from Columbus, Ohio, headed by uh, Bob Quinn. Quinn had been general manager 
in the 1920s, early 20s for the Browns. St. Louis Browns had finished runner-up to the Yankees twice. Of course, they had the great George Sisler, so Hall of Fame first baseman and 400 hitter a couple of times. So Quinn came to Boston and didn't have any money, did the best he could for about eight or nine years, and then went bankrupt during the Depression of 1929. In stepped Tom Yorkey, as you pointed out. He purchased the team from Quinn and paid off all of uh, Robert Quinn's million dollar debt and kept the Quinn on for one year as general manager because of his trustworthiness and constant uh, searching for ball players. But uh, after that, it was Eddie Collins. Then they hired Bucky Harris as a manager. Harris and Collins were enemies from their playing days in the 1920s as ball players. Then he picked up Joe Cronin in 1935, and of course there were troubles there. Pinky Higgins, later a general manager and field manager, more problems, and uh, the, the organization really went downhill. The glory year, Bill, as you pointed out, was the year after the war, 1946. Oh, that, that, was a, that was a great year, great year. Never quite got to the top, but it was a great year. Now, you, you can see as they, you get towards World War II, you start seeing evolve this competition between the Yankees and the Red Sox. You mentioned 38, 39, and 40, and 41. 41, Bro 42. 41, 42, right. all the years that uh, uh, the Yankees and the Red Sox Ended up one two, Yankees number one, Sox two, and that continued. That really created, I think, the, uh, uh, the the start of the real strong rivalry between the two teams. I, I don't think they had that well, much uh, of a uh, immediate rivalry before that time. Originally, they went back to the curse of the Bambino, but the Yankees were in the World Series, uh, losing in twenty one and twenty two to the Giants winning in 23, the year Yankee Stadium opened. Then they were back, uh, let's see, in 26, they lost to the Cardinals in seven games. 28, they beat the Cardinals in four games. Then the Athletics took over and won uh, three pennants, 29, 30, World Series champions. 32, I mean 31, they lost to the uh, Cardinals but the Depression hit Connie Mack after being in three straight World Series. He had to sell all his ball players, many of whom went to the Red Sox. Fox. Fox and Grove, Bing yeah, Miller. Grove also, right. Yeah, Bing Miller uh, was an outfielder. Max Bishop, second baseman. But the main ones, Jimmy Fox and uh, Lefty Grove. Grove won his 300th game in 41. And Jimmy Fox... Uh, set the Red Sox record for many years, most home runs in a season. The year I was born, 1938, Jimmy hit 50 home runs. He had hit 58 for the Athletics in 1932. But Big Poppy, in our own lifetime, surpassed the record yeah, of Jimmy Fox. Right. Yeah. So those were strange years for Boston. A lot of money spent, but nothing to show for it. So well, 40, I think it was 16. Starting to, starting to pay off. 40, in the 16. Early 40s, and then they lost their talent during World War II. I mean, they lost Ted Williams, Johnny Pesky, Tex Houston, who was probably the uh, top pitcher in the league at the time. He uh, was, yep. Dave and, Ferris. And, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, so they were uh, totally decimated at that time, but they all came back. And we're ready to play ball in 46. And they, uh, they started right out of the gate, I think, and, and were in control of the, the league by the time they uh, probably get into May or June. They was were up in double digit games. Uh, 30 and 9 they started. 30 and 9. Fantastic, yeah. yeah they uh, they uh, went through it with ease. The Yankees in 46 were in desperate straits. They used three managers Joe McCarthy who had won many World Series championships with them. 
quit because of harassment from uh, the owner, uh, Larry McPhail. Bill Dickey took over for a while. He was a Hall of Fame catcher for the Yankees during right. many of their championship years. He quit after a, a month of service and they ended up with a coach, Johnny Noon, as the manager. In 47, they uh, cleaned house totally and uh, brought in Bucky Harris, who had managed the Washington Senators as a player manager at age 27 back in 1924. So that was the beginning of the resurgence of the Yankees in 47. Red Sox, definitely the best team in 46. I thought they should have won that World Series, but a strange thing happened, Bill. The National League pennant race ended in a tie between Brooklyn and the St. Louis Cardinals, and it was ruled that they had to have a three-game playoff. So they were going to St. Louis to play game one, then the next two if needed, Ebbets Field. During that period, the Red Sox decided they would play an exhibition game against an organized group of American leaguers. One of the pitchers, Washington Senator knuckleballer Mickey Hefner, pitching at Fenway Park in the practice game against Ted Williams, threw a knuckleball, got out of control, hit Williams in the elbow. Williams only got a couple of ground ball singles in the World Series was very ineffective. Yeah, hit something like 150 or something. Exactly. Like in the, uh, All because of that pickup game. And uh, of course, the Cardinals beat the Red Sox in seven games. We'll have more to say about that World Series along with the 67, uh, 80, I mean 75 and 86 World Series losses. Well, you're a wealth of knowledge, uh, Bob, about the uh, baseball. Well, I, I thank you the for appearing in studio today, Bill. Oh, I know you're, welcome. you're, you're welcome. a great baseball fan. And from deep in the heart of studio here on uh, Main Street in Somerset for SATV9, my guest, Bill O'Neill. This is Bob Souza thanking everybody for being with us as we're rounding third and heading home.